So okay, thank you very much. Uh, um, so we, we have this is like not the last session. We have one more to go in June. But um, so I'm very happy to have you here. So the my my my, per, my personal the, the way I came across Hugh's work was uh, through um, uh, one uh, book chapter he contributed in a, in a volume and was also contributed to a yeah. couple of years ago uh, in a paper with Philippe Brunman. Uh, which uh, it was really uh, it was very interesting because it defends, in my opinion, a very uh, un, uh, a controversial and unconventional approach to organismal agency. Uh, and um, the people was I found the paper absolutely brilliant. And so and that was so I, I the first time I I I, I, um, I saw your work I thought you were just a philosopher of biology, but then. Uh, Charles organized a, a conference and you were speaking as, about something absolutely different which was more about social oh, epistemology yes. and uh, so it's, it's, it's a very and this is something I usually am no, no interested in no, no interest in but the, 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 the I found the, the talk absolutely <coughs> brilliant as well so it's a very uh, he has a very broad uh, set of interests in bio, bioethics, human nature Social epistemology and is a practicing violinist, right? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, that's exactly yeah. So uh, <laughs> it's uh, no, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I, 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 I found uh, I found him a, a very very impressive character, and so I'm very very excited to uh, hear him talk about uh, organismal agency. Please. All right. Well, that's very generous of you, uh, Andrea. Of course, now I. The expectation, so I never, <laughs> never meet, be able to meet them. Uh, but it's true. I after I mean I'm philosopher biology mainly, but I spent a couple of years in an ethics center. Uh, out of choice, I wanted to broaden interest somewhat, but it's uh, influenced my thinking as well, and it'll actually um, come up in this talk today. So, topic is agency. Um, some of you might know that there's a bit of a resurgence in this uh, concept in among philosophers of biology and biologists. Um, and so I want to mainly sketch an intuition of the different way of thinking about organismic agency or agency in organisms, um, kind of changing the, the paradigm form of agency uh, from intentionality to what I would describe as deliberation. Um, but in this being Friday afternoon as well, uh, I just want to kind of talk a bit more broadly about what's at stake concerning agency and kind of try to situate also the current concern for agency in, in a historical context, not only history of evolutionary biology, but even history of science um, as such. And as a preparation for introducing this idea about deliberation, I'll then try to narrow down some of the main philosophical problems concerning agency in uh, philosophy of biology and how the current accounts fare. So what's agency? Uh, you know, in, in, in the broader context, it's of course, uh, a concept that's used in, in feminist discourse a lot, you think about you know, empowerment, disempowerment, the agency that's being respected and so on. Um, and whether coincidence or not, uh, the, the term has seeped into uh, biology, um, and ethology, the study of animal behavior in particular. And so what people have in mind when they talk about agency is a type of goal-directed a type of teleology, so stags, lock antlers, in order to gain access to mates. E. coli swim up gradient, nutrient gradients to get at the source. Even metabolic structures have certain goal directedness, right? Uh, so the, the iron metabolism has as its goal uh, the storing of iron within the organism. So. Of course, this, this covers a huge range of phenomena uh, from you know, something that's recognizably cognitive and that you might think, okay, perhaps, perhaps some 
agency to something that would almost seem <coughs> far fetched to describe that as atemporal. Um, so within philosophy of biology, there's been a long tradition of attention for functional explanations. So just to contrast that, so agent, agential explanations are also teleological, and like the go goals are an explanance in the explanation. But the difference is that the goal is attached to the whole organism instead of the part. So you know, Darwin's finches, the beaks have a function, uh, and the, the process of adaptation, of course, is shaped, uh, the shape of the beak adaptive to the type of seed um, that it's supposed to be able to peck at. But an agential type of language would then be talking about the finch as, as, a, as a whole organism. So there's kind of give you kind of a causal overview of what's going on. So mainly the paradigmatic examples of agential phenomena concern behavior, even though that can be generalized. And so the organism is thought to be the cause of that behavior. Um, and of course, you know, is that the most detailed explanation you can give. Well, of course, you could go back further. The causal tree uh, point to external processes, constitutive processes within the organism that are also responsible for the behavior. So what a gentle explanation does is kind of screens off those other sources of causal explanation. So it tries to present the organism as a whole as a kind of primitive causal explanation. So that's, that's what's going on in a gentle explanation. Of course, the, the challenge then is to make sense of well, why, that, why that type of explanatory structure uh, makes sense. Why, why would, in one under what conditions, can, can you kind of screen off those, those other causal processes? And the main competitor is uh, selectionist explanation. So, of course, you know, if you think of the stag behavior, uh, you could explain the stag behavior by referring to certain cognitive mechanisms that were shaped by a history of natural selection, uh, that these cognitive mechanisms uh, contribute to reproductive success and are triggered under certain conditions, and that's why the stags exhibited this behavior. Uh, an existential explanation will refer then to the the organism as a whole, so they are kind of competing um, at, at some level. Um, and the question is, can the one be converted into the other without any additional cost? So that's, that's kind of the other big difference with functional explanation. It's kind of consensus that you can translate functional explanations into selections terms without losing anything real, you know, the, the function of the heart is to pump blood, that's the, the, the toy example that's, that's always used. Um, but the, it's more of a real question whether that same type of translation can be done with the gentle explanations without uh, additional costs. So, yeah, this behavior can, have, can, can, be, can be given a selectionist explanation. So the question then is, well, uh, is, is the agential explanation doing any additional work? Why talk about agency at all? And so this is, this is broadening the problem somewhat. Uh, so why are we even talking about agency? What motivates uh, naturalists to even invoke this concept. Right? <coughs> and one very intuitive case, it's not always mentioned, um, but that's kind, of, that's kind of in the background, is that, well, in, in the details of how ethologists interact with, with animals, so then perhaps details that don't, don't always make it into uh, the causal models that are published uh, in papers, but there is 
kind of a strong intuition among ethologists that yeah, you can't explain all aspects of animal behavior simply in terms of, for instance, fitness maximization. Um, so that's James Goodall, and uh, so the thing the chimp is picking out fleas or attempting to, which is of course uh, a sign of affection or social bonding. Um, uh, pet owners uh, get very attached to their pets. They have kind of in close contact with their pets uh, every day. I don't, I don't have pets, so I have children instead. <laughs> um, the same. <laughs> That's right. um, so, you know, a, a, a dog owner is very attached to the dog. It's most likely not going to experience the dog's reaction as, oh, well, this is just you know, the manifestation of kind of a long process of artificial selection from the European wolf. Uh, it doesn't really care about me, this unconditional love I think that I'm receiving. It's not really about me, it's just about the satisfaction of some cognitive disposition. Of course, uh, yeah, I, have, I haven't come across a dog owner who is so detached from their dog in that way. Uh, there seems to be strong intuitions that, that, that uh, organisms are, are agents in some sense. Now, of course, that's, that's anecdotal. Um, there's also a stronger empirical case, and so this is where the, the, how agency has um, become, an, become an issue within um, the philosophy of biology and, and theoretical biology. And it goes back to what you do with noise um, that's caused by variation in environmental input. So um, we'll, we'll come back to, to the, the history of uh, evolutionary biology in a second, but one core type of experiment done since 1930s, I guess, uh, called common garden experiments. So you you keep, you know, it's, it's in the same garden. You keep the environmental factors constant, but you have different variants, and then you observe the different phenotypes that develop from that. Um, and why is that crucial? Of course, then you can make the right choices of you know which variants are the more uh, desirable, and, and have an effective process of artificial selection. Um, so, you know, if you have two causal inputs to the phenotype, environment, genotype, it, the common garden experiment kind of uh, crosses out that, that environmental input. But in a common garden, uh, this concept that uh, even, a, even a garden is a totally homogeneous environment is, of course, an idealization. Even of real gardens, uh, you know, grass will grow in, in different ways, different types of grass, uh, different kind of micro condition conditions. And it was standard for a lot of, um, definitely between the 1930s and let's say 1970s, to dismiss all of that as noise. Um, and this is actually an old complaint. Um, can trace it back 1965, to Bradshaw complaining that um, lack of stability indicates lack of adaptation, which you, in, in this context you could phrase as, well, if varying phenotypes without clear uh, environmental differences, so the, without clear factors to which these variants are adaptive, you just dismiss that as noise. And that was criticized as, I mean, describing that as noise is more a sign of the shortcomings of the model rather than as actual true noise. So, you know, just a, just a rough uh, distinction along the way. Like, it's, this type of noise, is, it's not like white noise, uh, like a sound that is produced by all frequencies at the same time. Um, there's actually a pattern there. Uh, it's, it was explanatory noise, so a phenomenon that can't be predicted by an idealized model, but um, 
in the case of phenotypic plasticity, that was so much the worse than for the model. So what's So in what sense can't we avoid agency here? Um, there are a lot of phenomena, developmental phenomena, and <coughs> thinking of uh, plants, but also uh, details of individual behavior of animals that cannot readily be explained as adaptive, um, but yet difficult to write off as noise or else they're adaptive, but selection can't fully explain it. So, you know, an example of the second, not seemingly adaptive, but yet difficult to write off as noise. I don't know, a pig swimming. And it's not particularly the environment in which they were selected for, but they seem to enjoy it nonetheless. Um, you know, it's difficult to write it off as noise. Um, Problem solving, this is this phenomenon called moss sponging that uh, chimps or, or bonobos um, take moss to dip into little water pools in order to, to drink. Um, obviously adaptive to, to, to an environmental factor, but it's not something that was necessarily directly selected for in the past. So that's as a general sketch of what we, or I at least, have in mind when talking about agency, um, and why it's not, it's, not, it's not something that just comes out of the blue. It, it, there are some, uh, how to deal with, with noise, how to deal with uh, behavior that's not, not adaptive, or that can't be fully explained by selection. That's, those are the type of phenomena where agency uh, becomes relevant. So you can ask different type of questions about agency. Uh, more ontological question, like what, what is agency now precisely? Uh, let's try to nail it down. Uh, how does it feature in scientific explanations? And then perhaps kind of the broadest um, is, well, what is its scientific status? Because you know it might, might agency might come across as uh, kind of a subjectivist projection onto animals, and uh, of course that's that's kind of one of the, the core problems in, in talking about agency. That well, does it does it not boil down to that something like that in the end? Um, and actually, it has it has a kind of a problematic uh, connection. With, uh, with science. So this talk will mainly focus on the first question. Uh, how can we kind of nail down what agency is in a more satisfactory way? I uh, won't talk that much about how it features in uh, scientific explanations. Yeah, the, the resolution isn't, isn't great, is it? Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, these are just uh, two papers uh, that I have on, on that topic. Um, but I just want to, before I get to the first question, which is a bit more technical, I want to sketch the broader context of agency. Um, because I think that's important to keep in mind what's really at stake. Because, uh, let's say, um, us analytic philosophers, we want to nail down the meaning of the concept, but then get very confused because we have different intuitions. Um, but yeah, keeping some historical context into consideration helps uh, reminding us what is at stake. So if agency comes across as a kind of a subjectivist projection, that's kind of, that's not a coincidence if you had that intuition, because it, agency genuinely does sit a bit uneasily with science. Uh, positive behavior is driven by kind of, let's say, as if intentions or values. You know, it does smack of an Aristotelian framework and very much 
uh, ill at ease with what I just called here causal mechanistic metaphysics. And of course, you know, uh, Descartes is describing kind of quasi agential phenomena here in mechanistic terms. You know, why is it that we feel pain uh, when you know, the foot is put close to the fire? And then he has like this kind of mechanistic explanation with animal spirits that course through um, the nerves. And Descartes isn't often connected to the life sciences, but of course that causal mechanistic picture of the world, it, it did take some time to really get uh, manifested in the life sciences, but it eventually did, and with huge effect. Uh, so, um, agency is, does try to avoid some type of reductionist uh, tendencies in the life sciences, but it's also important to remember that, well, there's nothing necessarily wrong with a causal mechanistic explanation itself, because, you know, for instance, gave us uh, germ theory uh, with, you know, uh, society changing consequences. So germ theory was developed over a period of some decades, let's say 1860s, 1890s, and then uh, that's 1930, so I guess it yeah, took, took a while before hospitals uh, had a more specific knowledge of <coughs> what causes infection and so on to uh, implement that in, in, in protocols and so on. But uh, yeah, maternal mortality, infant mortality goes down really spectacularly from 1940 here and 1920. Similar, something, something similar. So I, 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 I titled that slide the uh, Masters and Possessors of Nature because, of course, 300 years before Descartes, uh, let's say, envisioned, can't say that he predicted, but he envisioned, envisaged uh, that this type of causal mechanistic type explanation would have yeah, huge consequences for uh, medicine. The other thing I'd like to highlight is the modern synthesis, which takes together natural selection and heredity in, in a statistical framework. And if you want to point to just like one uh, society changing consequence that that had, then you probably should point to crop yields, um, which uh, so like new, it allowed for new plant breeding techniques, some genetic engineering, I guess a bit later. Um, and so that, I think that's, if I remember, that's the yields in France. And of course the yields don't increase for all, um, all crops equally. But if you take maize, corn, that increases like seven or eight fold. Uh, so, this talk will, will be a bit critical, I guess, of a causal mechanistic approach to organisms, but, you know, I'm just mentioning this because we should be balanced as well at the same time, uh, because sometimes mechanism and reductionism become, become bad words. Uh, and, you know, there are some failures, of course, uh, attached to, let's say, the causal mechanistic metaphysics. If you try to especially explain human behavior in, in a, a simple mechanistic way, that's of course associated with some of the worst excesses um, of science-inspired policy, let's say. So if, if you think skull shapes are a dominant causal exponence of behavior, right? <laughs> get phrenology, and then of course even more um, uh, yeah, even more uh, dramatically, eugenics was based on this idea that, of course, genes are the dominant cause of behavior. So it's, that's, of course, the dark side of control. 
Um, I had a historical aside about Fisher. I'll skip that. Fisher is somebody who combines all these aspects. You know, the founding figure of modern synthesis. He actually started out working on <coughs> crop yields, uh, you know, in invented analysis of variants along the way, um, and was also a major eugenicist. So agency is to be situated in kind of a long tradition of intellectual reaction against, let's say, a mechanistic approach to organisms. Um, and I mean, the mechanistic approach to organisms, it, it, it really does follow some of the, let's say, Galilean uh, explanatory strategies of idealization and isolation of a certain causal pathway you know, uh, the inclined plane idealizes or abstracts away from friction. And in the same way, uh, early evolutionary biologists abstracted away from the environment. Uh, it, allowed, it allows for causal control of phenotypes, right? Causal control of human body, that's medicine, human enhancement, plants and animals, agriculture. But the difference, of course, with the relatively uh, innocent case of the in inclined plane is that if you have these idealized models of the causes of human behavior and you abstract away from certain crucial uh, sources of causal complexity, <coughs> well, that's how you end up with, with models where skulls and genes play outsized role. So agency can be situated on this parallel trajectory that's run alongside uh, the life, life, mechanistic life sciences pretty much since the 18th century. It started in the 18th century. Um, vitalism itself had maybe a bit of a heyday late 19th century. Uh, but it's closely li linked to what's also called organicism, which is a bit more of a just a it's kind of a reaction against mechanism it just it, it states that well if you want to organ, understand organisms it can't be done in a merely mechanistic way so of course vitalism remains a tainted uh, word and so of course I never want to say that agency is kind of a neo-vitalistic concept because yeah you can't fight those associations but it's Vitalism is often understood as some type of causal vitalism, right? There's, there's this causal principle, like life force, as if it's a type of mechanism. So, yeah, you could argue that the, the, the version of vitalism that's kind of still uh, a bit taboo or seen as tainted, it's not just pseudoscientific, but it also goes in against, well, the, the core, the core assumptions of vitalism. Explanatory vitalism, uh, in that sense, never really died. And you know, this, this was, of course, uh, a very uh, provocative paper, molecular vitalism. But you have, of course, like, with a title like that, you, you, you can't not cite something like that. Organisms not equal to machines. Um, and so that, that tradition in plot biology is alive and well. I had a little, little aside here, connecting this to the modern synthesis, so that a lot of, there's a lot of critique of the modern synthesis, uh, like the Fisherian style, uh, and in many ways it's pointing to the role of the organism. Uh, in, in evolution. So th that's kind of what's at stake. Uh, so it, it, it can seem like an intellectual fashion that people are suddenly talking about agency now, but it actually really <coughs> is, is rooted in, in a long tradition of some of the most, most important questions of, uh, of thinking about life and organisms and and situating the life sciences also within the larger 
uh, scientific project. So onto the, the question I wanted to focus on. So what is, a, what, what is agency? Um, how can we give some kind of more of a positive characterization of it? And of course, when we ask what is agency, we're, we're still working within a basic causal mechanistic in physics. So that's, in the end, that's not, that's not questioned. There are some who, you know, you have neo-Aristotelians, or especially neo-Thomists, um, who, who, uh, who would reject this causal mechanistic metaphysics. And, uh, but, but I'm not going to do that because, well, it's, it's not really... I mean, just the, the scientific community is too large to ignore. You can't, you can't go any against that. And uh, yeah, and if I say that the causal mechanistic metaphysics is dominant, then of course you know if you think about Newton's action at a distance, well, sure he he did depart from it, but it was always an anomaly. It was always an experiment. Of what does it really mean? This action at a distance, and so you know the it's kind of there was a sense of closure then when uh, finally okay Einstein could explain what it actually meant, this action at a distance. So asking what is agency, the, the, the basic terms uh, of analysis still are you know, the ones that we know and love of causes and processes and mechanisms. And it's a very confusing uh, domain because it's so uh, interdisciplinary. You have psychologists, theoretical psychologists, thinking about these type of issues, uh, computer scientists, cyberneticists, you have biologists, you have neuroscientists. Um, so this is obviously a, a simplification. I guess I, I've mainly been led by which ways of thinking have been taken up already by other philosophers. And uh, so number one on the list, is behavioral ecology. So that's Samir Okasha's recent book. And he, uh, so that model, I won't be going into detail on any of these, um, but that model uh, understands organismic agency as a type of fitness maximization. So uh, why do stags lock antlers? It's because that behavior. Uh, maximizes fitness. So it's a, it's a model where quasi the, the model of the economic agent, utility maximizing agent is, is applied then to the organism. And why does that make sense? Of course because in many cases natural selection will have you know, uh, ensured that these behaviors are fitness maximizing. So in, in Okasha is concerned then, okay, well, under what conditions can we say that organisms are fitness maximizing uh, and so on? And, and he, he, views, he views agency basically as, as, as a heuristic, uh, as a handy heuristic to, um, to analyze and describe animal behavior. Avropoesis <coughs> is another. Uh, Basic idea is that organisms act in order to maintain organization, the internal organization. So the, the, the word autopoiesis is self-making. Um, there's a whole uh, technical apparatus around that. Call this ecological, number three is ecological psychology, um, mainly associated with Dennis Walsh. Um, and he, he reconceptualizes the, the organism environment ensemble as kind of somehow unified. So he actually turns, it, turns the relation between natural selection and organisms on its head. So if you're familiar with this work on statisticalism, uh, natural selection is actually not, not a real causal principle. It's really just a statistical summary of what's happening on the ground with individual organisms. 
uh, and the organisms are like agents responding to opportunities that they perceive in the environment. So it's it's kind of a yeah, it's, it's a redescription of the phenomenon. Um, yeah, and there's I mean that's that's like the main representation we have in our little domain of philosophy of science. But of course that's it's it's pretty huge um, and activism is pretty huge among, among psychologists. This idea that uh, the, the organism is embodied and that experiences reflect this embodiment and these are the needs of the organism. And finally, I added... So just a question. Yeah. And yeah. activism is really well developed in psychology because I don't know that. In activism? In activism, because it's very popular in Belgium. Yeah, yeah, it's true. But is it? <laughs> but is it? I mean, I mean, just, it's just a question. Is it? Is it well developed around in psychological department around the world? Just, just uh, I think my comment was more um, uh, a comment on the quantity of publication. Okay. Okay. Because you're asking, of course, about the <laughs> conceptual development, mm -hmm. which is, of course, uh, not uh, a different issue, and. So it's a very active field of research. Okay. It's a very active field of research, and there's a lot of skepticism towards that, as there is skepticism towards autopoiesis, mm -hmm. and a growing skepticism, skepticism towards the free energy principle, which is, which is proposed, associated with Carl Friston, uh, and it's also proposed as this grand unifying scheme that explains human behavior, but goes much further, explains all animal behavior too. And it uses some kind of core concepts from you know, information theoretical thermodynamics, minimizing surprise, and surprise is defined as, well, obviously unexpected states for the organism, which then is with high entropy, uh, and plus surprise is, is defined in a valenced way, so organisms always expect what's good for them. So yeah, uh, there's some nervousness about how these concepts are being used here, uh, especially the, the broad claims that are being made, um, and it's unclear what new predictions are being generated. Um, and that, of course, would be, yeah, there'll be a, a whole different discussion. Uh, it's, it's almost, yeah, my, my speculation is almost that it, it's almost indicative of agencies' problematic relationship with science, that when, when people try to grasp in some way what agency is, they're kind of veering off. Um, but, well, I won't say any more before I... Offend anybody? <laughs> but so these are these are <coughs> four models with a lot of adherence, um, a lot of skeptical voices as well, uh, or at least quizzical. It's not unclear where it's precisely leading. A lot of promises being made, but um, but the good news is I'm going to sidestep all of that. <laughs> So, um, so I, I, what I, I'm only going to take uh, what, a, what is of interest to me is kind of a common theme in all of these. Uh, and it's as if that there are all kind of attempts to naturalize intentionality in some way. Intentionality, what's an intention for our purposes? Let's just say it's a, a conscious mental representation of a future state of affairs. So, uh, you know, um, future state of affairs, eating uh, a yummy cookie, uh, the baby seems to be quite intent on grabbing the cookie, um, the young kids, um, there might be some obstacles placed, uh, in between 
you know, their intention and their, the, the state of affairs that they desire. And so they'll find a way around those obstacles. So it's intentional action as there's, it's goal directed. Um, but there are multiple pathways in which this goal can be realized. Um, and so my suggestion is going to be that, well, a lot of these models adopt this basic type of explanatory framework, uh, this basic type of relation between the goal and the possible action. Now, just a short aside, so intentionality is, of course, a huge uh, concept, uh, or let's say very, very uh, present in many domains outside of the narrow one of philosophy of biology. Philosophy of action is central. Uh, so there, there's basically only interest in intentional action. So intentionality is the core concept for philosophy of action. Their, their central problem is how, how can you distinguish between genuine action and mere happening? So, you know, I, I move my leg. Uh, that seems to be intentional, but if somebody kicks my leg from the back and it moves, that's a mere happening. So, intention is the difference maker. Um, and that's, that's kind of their, their starting point from which then a whole literature is, is generated because there are a lot of great cases, of course. Um, but for the context of philosophy of biology, that type of conscious mental representation is not very, I mean, it's not directly useful because most organisms under consideration don't have a cognitive apparatus, they don't have consciousness, at least according to how those concepts are ordinarily understood. Um, of course, one response is that you start stretching those concepts. So, you know, <coughs> a table might be conscious in some way, uh, even. Uh, and, and, and then for sure, then the E. coli bacteria. Um, but let's say among philosophers of science, the more common response has been to decouple those, those two, agency and intentionality. So my point is that it's, it's been decoupled, it's, and intentionality has kind of been naturalized, but the basic explanatory signature kind of remains. Uh, intentionality still re retains its kind of paradigmatic status as agential behavior. The translation itself is not, there's nothing mysterious necessarily going on with this type of goal directedness, different types of action. You know, uh, the end state is the explanance, but that doesn't mean, that doesn't entail retro causation, of course, right? Uh, you know, if optimization or if lack of sensitivity to initial conditions, path independence, basins of attraction, there's all sorts of uh, conceptual resources uh, in dynamics to make, make sense of these type of teleological explanations. And yeah, because I mentioned that because sometimes it's problematized, but it, it, you know, there's Elliot Sober, 1983, who I think was one of the first to introduce those types of explanatory structures of lack of sensitivity to initial conditions. So, <clears throat> how does this then apply to like the, the models? I mentioned. So say the behavior is an, an organism, bacteria, moves from low nutritional density to high nutritional density. So the, the different models will refer to different type of goals to explain that behavior. So in order to maximize fitness, in order to maintain internal organization, because, well, if the bacteria remains in the low nutritional environment, it will you know, eventually decay. Um, in order to re res respond to a perceived opportunity. And so, in the end, I think that the 
the current models are not satisfactory because they don't really show, they don't, they don't really um, add anything uh, that natural selection can't already do. So this is, in the end, the, the most fundamental challenge for any uh, understanding of agency is that, well, you know, natural selection is, did you, did you have your hand up? No. Oh, no. And natural selection is a pretty important uh, theory that was precisely introduced to explain apparent design, apparent purposiveness. Uh, in, in think of Paley's uh, watch that's been found on the sand. Uh, that it, it seems to indicate some uh, agent that's made it. Uh, Paley thought it was a divine agent. Natural selection shows that, well, actually, you can have just a purely uh, a causal process leading up to that. And so all these models of agency, in the end, they don't really address that problem. And they don't really characterize agency in such a way that, well, they, that, that the agential behavior can't be equally well explained by uh, a process of selection. Now, there are two responses to that. I mean, I've, I've, I've tried to uh, respond to that in, in, in other papers that to look at the conditions of applicability for selectionist explanations. So, okay, where, where should we look for uh, areas where agency is actually doing real or distinctive explanatory work? Okay, well, let's look at phenomena where selectionist explanations don't apply and in particular at environmental novelty, heterogeneity, so kind of new circumstances that, uh, that can't have uh, done, been present in, 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 the, in the selectionist history. But it's my motivation for talking about deliberation in this talk is some dissatisfaction with that because it's a negative characterization of agency. It's kind of filling the <coughs> gaps wherever you know selection can't explain the apparent purposiveness okay well then we're allowed to talk about agency but it still doesn't really give much uh, it's not very informative of what is an agency you have to get there now because we are waiting I want the answer. <laughs> It's a big problem, I'm convinced. Everything is bad. Okay. Okay. Save us. All right. yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, so my solution, yes, of course. <laughs> um, so the proposal is that um, intentional action, in, instead of having one goal involved, deliberative action involves multiple goals, um, and the process of optimization is not directed at a particular state of affairs, but at, or well, okay, just a negative characterization. It's not directed at a particular state of affairs. So the toy example, goal to get cookies, uh, the, a deliberative approach would be weighing different goals here I said enjoyment and avoiding parents anger uh, of course uh, you know, uh, uh, and um, yeah so and the, the action is to realize the goal here the action is more a result of a tug of war uh, there's certainty there about what is the desired state of affairs. Here, there's uncertainty. Will I do it? Will I not do it? But the end result is that here, an, a genuine decision is actually made. So, of course, the child might say, well, you know, weighing the different factors here, still the enjoyment of the cookie uh, it weighs more heavily than any potential downsides. 
I might experience. Um, and that, that would, of course, be then a deliberative action. Now, what I have in mind as more par uh, examples of paradigmatic deliberation are more in context of ethics and law. So, like the ethical dilemma, uh, you're, you're not, uh, uh, security. Security. a customer walks in, uh, gives signs of being addicted to the pain medication. What do you do? Do you just you give it? They have the prescription. Well, you have a series of non-optimal options. Uh, each has each has downsides. You refuse medication but risk patronizing them. You give them medication, but then you risk being complicit. Or do you go behind their back and talk to the physician who just prescribed the medication in the first place? So that's kind of an ethical dilemma. There's really no uh, clear course of action that's that, that, that's that's the best. There needs to be a weighing of the courses of action according to different values. And if you do know what to do beforehand without kind of weighing the specifics of the situation, then that would be uh, a case of a bias. The judge, another uh, paradigmatic case of deliberation. So the, the role of the judge is determining the sanction. So not, not to determine guilt, that's you know, the, the jury or the prosecutor. Uh, what is the sanction? And of course, many factors weigh uh, uh, the response, what the law mandates, recommends, the character uh, of the defendant, uh, whether they're showing genuine remorse. These are all things that can be uh, mitigating or aggravating uh, circumstances. And so the, not only uh, does the, do judges take those specifics into consideration, but they're expected to take those specifics into consideration because you know, just only doing what the law mandates, well, usually laws are not written precisely enough for that. But even if they would do, try to do that without kind of sensitivity to the particulars, that would be a form of bias and, and would lead to uh, uh, unjust um, uh, decisions. So the deliberate. It's, it's interesting that the, the symbol of justice kind of uh, brings together some of the core properties of deliberation, where you're you're weighing. It's the, the main scales. Uh, there's uh, Lady Justice is blind. There's no foregone conclusion, and then the sword means that in, in the end the decision is made, and. In that respect, uh, deliberation is, is a much older concept than intentionality. Whatever, there's some optimization going on here, but whatever is being optimized is definitely not something that represents a particular state of affairs. It's injustice or the good. So the deliberating agent is not acting in order to realize a, con uh, a future state of affairs. And a good metaphor here is um, uh, drug addiction. Uh, is drug addiction, it can be the result of intentional action. You know, the, the drug addict intends to use the choice drug. But yet at the same time it is paradigmatically unfree. Uh, even though there's no external coercion, but it's not, a, it's not a free action. So from the perspective of deliberation, it's, there's basically no real deliberation going on with the drug addict. You know, should I take the drug, should I not? Well, in the end, it's a, it's a bit of a foregone conclusion. And this addiction is, can be a metaphor, kind of an intuitive way of thinking about how natural selection kind of upends that deliberation. So, for instance, I don't think necessarily that stags competing is kind of deliberative uh, necessarily. That, that can be uh, uh, understood as, as kind of just a, a, a simple kind of intentional action. And quite, no, sorry, um, as if intentional. Uh, but it has kind of been determined by, by natural selection. I should wrap up here. Uh, 
so I'm running a bit over time. How to naturalize? So um, unlike, so they, let's say that the, the basic naturalistic picture of intention, intentional action is some type of optimization. Uh, the, the best metaphor or comparison, I think, for what's going on causally here is a type of symmetry breaking or a phase transition. So there's a deliberation, different factors involved, the symmetries are the possible courses of action, and then the decision is the one or the other. So the, one of the examples, of course, is transition from paramagnetism to ferromagnetism as temperature is, is lowered and all the magnets are oriented in, in random directions. And then once it's below the Curie temperature, they align in magnetic domains. And it is, there's, you know, if there's no external magnetic field, in the end, it will be somewhat random which way the magnetic domains will be oriented. Uh, but yes, it is, you know, as if uh, a decision is, is being made. So how do we apply this to one of the most basic potential agential phenomena, which would be chemotaxis, uh, swimming up uh, gradients, uh, you know, bacteria, sensing uh, particular substances in the environment, reacting to it accordingly. It's, it's an it's an open secret that most chemotaxis mechanisms are not so simple as the ones that we often find in textbooks. So if you see something like that, okay, well, there are a couple of calls and arrows, but you could kind of more or less, without losing much, uh, summarize it as you know some type of function, input and then output. Um, and it would just seem to be uh, a normal, uh, as if intentional process, but really one that can be replaced by a more precise mechanistic explanation. So that, okay, you can say that, uh, you know, uh, some commentators would say, oh yeah, but look, it's goal directed, the, the bacteria is, you know, directed towards the source of nutrition. But it's not really persuasive because, well, yeah, but you can you can be more precise and you can point to the precise properties of that mechanism that was shown in the previous slide, and that is you know kind of the real <coughs> causal pathway. You don't need to refer to the organism as a whole; it's the precise chemotaxis mechanism. But so it's an open secret that uh, many chemotaxis mechanisms are, are much more complex. Than that. And so, um, and one in particular that they don't only can take into consideration uh, inputs from outside, but also uh, called here metabolic sensing uh, inputs from within the organism. So that's at least two very different types uh, of inputs to a very different type of, let's say, goals uh, to be to be weighed and. And this is like how uh, I did not have a citation here, but this is how that article talked about this type of mechanism that multiple different signals are integrated in order to produce a balanced response, which is deliberative uh, language. Other um, other uh, facts that complicate a simple functional explanation of chemotaxis is that, well, um, there are many different types of substances in, in the environment with coming in different intensities and signals can be potentially confusing the bacteria. Uh, the directionality is statistical, so it's not as if that they just sense uh, uh, the presence of some substance and they change direction. It produces a, a reaction, produce, production of proteins, 
which can be modulated and it's more, more precise to say that bacteria are more or less likely to go in a certain direction. And crucially, uh, bacteria pause when the signal is unclear. So they pause and they can reverse direction. Um, and all of these issues are usually, they're, they're not really um, highlighted. Um, and you could wonder why they're not highlighted. Because um, this, I don't, I don't see it, but it's an article from 1990. So it's, it's 30 years old. But there's not that much attention into how they pause and change direction and so on. If you, if you look at recent literature, it seems a lot of attention seems to go to human neutrophil, which is a type of white blood cell. Um, and I, I, had a, I had a video maybe that can play in the background. Um, oh yeah, here we go. Um, and uh, of course, you know, that, that I think that's a, that, that's a type of yeast uh, that, the, uh, that the experimenter is putting in the vicinity. And of course, uh, the, the, the white blood cells uh, sense the presence of those substances and change direction. And if you see that, you could say, well, yeah, well, that's obviously just some kind of simple mechanism. Uh, and a lot of attention in ke regarding chemotaxis has gone to phenomena like that. And one could speculate that, well, of course, we're very interested in understanding human immune response precisely because it's so important for health outcomes. But it's not necessarily very indicative of the nature of chemotaxis because, well, one, it's a, it's a laboratory condition. So the, it's, the signals are going to be much more clear than in, in the wild. And two, these bacteria are evolved to be highly specialized and to, to, uh, to pick up on a very narrow range of possible inputs. So, um, I don't know, some final remarks, trying to anticipate some objections or, or, or questions. Um, so the idea is that bacteria weigh different goals. There's uncertainty in the sensory inputs. And that this is the type of, this is what a agency should be understood as in a more paradigmatic sense. Of course, whether particular behaviors are agential or not, you have to look at the, uh, at, at the qualifying factors. Um, agency is not some mystical, you know, vitalistic quantity here. Uh, it's, it describes more kind of an explanatory structure with symmetries, uh, where the you know, courses of actions are symmetries. Uh, the sensory inputs come at different intensities and cause uh, this the deliberation to go one way or another within the organism, um, but crucially, it's it, it screens off natural selection in the following way. Uh, and I know, yeah, well, this is not super developed, but uh, selection you can be you can think of selection as defining the types of action, but as deliberation as explaining why this rather than that action was taken. So, um, agency as deliberation explains why the particularities of individual behavior are not merely noise. Uh, so why the bacteria goes in that direction rather <coughs> than another direction. Uh, selection doesn't have that much to say about though that level of detail. Um, and that's where we, uh, that's where agency has a, has a role to play. So in conclusion, um, you know, different types of uh, behavior of living organisms, they're not necessarily all agential. I don't think that life should be equated with agency. But if you're asking whether behavior is agential, the question is not really whether it's goal-directed. That's, that's, not, that's not enough, because uh, natural selection does that quite well. But rather, the question should be, is the behavior the result of 
weighing multiple goals uh, and possible courses of action. All right, that's it. Thank you. So, thanks a lot for the incredibly rich talk. So, I have myself a few questions, but I'm going to open it up to the room. Let me see. see. <coughs> nothing, nothing yet coming in on chat. I'll let you know. Please. Yeah, thanks a lot. That was an uh, excellent talk. Uh, very uh, thought provoking. I have some things that are not entirely clear. Um, so, you uh, mentioned goals several times. Um, and weighing goals and so on. Um, but you don't speak <coughs> about outcomes or possible outcomes. And I mean, there seems to be something like, um, like even if you have just one goal, you might want to, uh, deliberation might be a matter of weighing possible outcomes with respect to that one goal. You, the child only wants to make their parents happy, for example. Suppose that they only have that one goal. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they go to see which outcome might maximize that specific goal. Um, and that seems to be already a difficult sort of deliberative process going on that seems to be along the lines of what you're getting at. The situation where you have like different sort of goals and different values and so on, uh, like uh, 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 wanting enjoyment from the pee to the cookie and uh, want to make your parents happy and maybe other things, they, they, that seems to be at a level that is even much more complicated. So, um, and then another thing that uh, I want to have more clarity about is this, the last thing you said about the types of uh, of actions, uh, of types of or types of behavior or something like that, um, which like would be interest like natural selection would be able to say something about types of uh, behavior while um, the deliberative model would say something about uh, individual behavior. Uh, like yeah. really. But I, I, I don't really buy that distinction. I see that it's much more about detail, and the one is more about large scale things, but it's always types you want to explain. It's you want to explain why the child typically uh, or that the bacteria typically goes for uh, a disease or whatever. Uh, I mean, I, I, I didn't see the example exactly, the, the, the cute uh, model of it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> the yeah. thing going for that. Um, uh, it seems that that's a, a type of behavior at a very small scale that you want to explain by the agent agentive uh, uh, model. Yeah, I say, but it's also a dive. It's never just one thing that doesn't seem to be something you want to explain. That is just noise, no? If you go to, oh, yeah. so it, it's about scale, but mm, it doesn't seem to be about like token types or whatever. This thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, you're right. Right to push me on that because I didn't really develop it. Um, uh, one response may be that <coughs> you should start. Distinguishing, uh, I mean, that there are two different types of type involved uh, mm -hmm. here. Um, because, I mean, saying that the science is involved, uh, interested only in types, um, you could, you could, that, that could be a controversial statement if you're saying, well, well that's precisely then why. Uh, uh, early population geneticists dismissed all types of environmental variation uh, as due to noise because, well, it didn't, didn't fit the, the type that they were interested in. Um, and so, uh, uh, se selection there may define certain uh, behavior types, but that doesn't mean that all behaviors that diverge from that type are necessarily just pure randomness or that they have no other type of explanation. So, and why is that? Well, uh, selection, I mean, selection is kind of a pretty crude process. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, 
the reproductive success of an organism, uh, it, it, it's a reflection of a lot of different <coughs> environmental circumstances it might have encountered during its lifetime. Uh, it's not necessarily very fine-grained. Uh, so it's not surprising that uh, types of behavior that are selected might, uh, might be coarse-grained in, in that way. But on the other hand, you could say, well, still, um, if it's a pattern, I mean, science is interested in patterns, and that's a behavioral type as well. So, and I, I, think, uh, yeah, I think you're right about that, yeah. And, and, and in that sense, um, <coughs> agency, I, yeah, what type of, what, what patterns does it describe? I don't know what patterns of behavior it describes. It, I guess it describes more a process by which behaviors are produced. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's, that's kind of, if I were to develop that point further, those would be the lines of, along which I would develop it. Um, and your first question was... Uh, um, about, uh, yeah, the, 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 you seem to be neat. You, seem, you mentioned uh, that you're always, that, that the, the, the fact that there's different goals seem to be something uh, uh, important while... Yes, yes, yes. About the, just different yes, the, the Machiavellian child who's wants those cookies but use its power for deliberation for <laughs> finding the best strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so m my distinction between uh, intentionality and deliberation was a bit crude. And I think what you described there is a, already a first kind of gray case and that you can say, begin to wonder, well, is that is that, would that fit more the intentional mold or the deliberation mold? I would say it's a type of more sophisticated intentional behavior because it still has a particular state of affair, affairs in mind as the outcome. Um, and the weighing involved is about the choice of strategy. Yeah. So it's kind of a combination almost that the the desired outcome is not in question, but the the what is in question is how precisely to reach it. And so you could say, well, there's an, a genuine deliberation going on here, but within the mm, intermediary outcome of which strategy is going to be chosen. Uh, so that's kind of I think how I would analyze that case. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot. So Helen and Alexander. Um, yeah, thank you. That was uh, really interesting. Uh, so uh, I think this is just a question of clarification, really. So in the case of the philosophy action, as you said, uh, intentional action, really central. Uh, so when it comes to human agency, uh, you know, the kind of deliberative actions, right, they're like a kind of subset of the um, uh, manifestations about agency, I take it, right? When I switch the light on, that's intentional, when I, I'm not deliberating about anything. Mm. Um, but people generally still see my switching on the light as a um, manifestation of my agency. So now in the case of the the deer and the... The stags and the stalking of the others, yeah. Yeah, you're, you're, so you, it, it, it sort of seems... So what you're, what you're sort of doing, if I get you right, is kind of saying, yeah, those kinds of cases where you've just got the single, you know, the analogy of kind of like what could be. I don't want to count those as, as, as manifestations of agency, is that right? It's just the deliberative ones that I want to count as manifestations of agency because we can give some other kind of, like, we could just give some, you know, or yeah. a story about that. Is that. And I just sort of, I suppose I kind of, and I th like I in the human case, it feels like I, I still want to hang on to the idea that like, you just want the room to be light and there's one way of doing it. You turn on the light, oh, yeah. you're being an agent. Well. So uh, I think, I, well, just as a preliminary mark, I think I would want to talk about what's paradigmatically agential, because, of course, because quickly, you know, you can start arguing about the meaning of, of words, and, and uh, um, because you could say, well, you know, agency, there must be some type of self-causing, kind of the, the, the organ 
organism as a whole that's the cause of the behavior and you're turning on the light. Well, it's me turning on the light, it's not something else. Um, why, and it's not deliberative, you could say, I mean, you could, you could take that behavior and start analyzing it in very different ways. Um, that uh, um, the engineers designing the switch have thought about how to do it in such a user-friendly way that we won't have to think about it too much, that's be, that'll be accessible. Uh, the, the workmen will have thought about where to place it as to guide our action in a certain way. Um, uh, we have developed habits of turning on and off lights. Um, and so once you start analyzing it in those ways, you're beginning to see about how <coughs> external factors are also playing a role in us uh, switching on and off the light in that particular way. So, um, but again, so I think that's like, that's like kind of fleshing out why is it not deliberative and how, if, if it's, let's say, merely intentional without being deliberative, how that there's some ambiguity there that you can perhaps also explain it uh, uh, by means of external causes. But do I want to say that it's not agential? No, I don't necessarily want to say that it's not agential. I just think that it's not, it's not necessarily doing that much extra. Okay. So but, uh, but, but like, uh, humans, of course, are, are a difficult case because we actually have conscious uh, mental representations. Uh, uh, so, I mean, in the, in the human case, you know, there's probably still some type of unconscious deliberation going on there. I mean, it's, we're not being determined by natural selection to turn on the lights uh, or any inherited cognitive mechanism. And it's, it's that contrast that's the important one, of course, when it comes to animal behavior. Right, so is it more that you're kind of thinking in the, in the animal case, uh, it's whatever is the case in the human case, in the animal case, it's, kind of like it's just more helpful to think of deliberation as the, the deliberative case as the kind of the, the core central case. And now there might be, you know, maybe there are some cases that are not clearly deliberative, that are sort of, you know, the animal yeah. turning on the light or whatever. And that's just a more helpful place to start than kind of coming at it from the other angle and, and, and thinking of the much more, yeah. sort of, I think, simplistic model that you can then, then maybe beef up for the complicated cases. Exactly, yeah. We should, yeah, start, yeah. With the, we should start with the most Yeah, because I think if you start with agency as goal-directedness, you, you, get, you run into confusions then because, well, right. natural selection can also shape goal-directed behavior. Right, okay, I get it, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, so I think I understood how the uh, deliberation can screen off some natural selection explanation, especially natural selection that you select for a specific behavior. But in the case, for example, of the bacteria, the mechanism of deliberation, the weighting, must be must be selective. So in that case, you would fall again on you know evolutionary psychology because. As you know better than me, after they try to explain specific behavior, they went in the wall and they say, no, it's the mechanism of choosing the, the behavior that is selected. So, so it looks a little bit like evolutionary psychology plus. So am I, where, where am I wrong? Uh, okay, 2.0, well, 2.0, I want to say it's been much better. <laughs> um, well, maybe first about the bacterial case, because that's uh, maybe, if anything, a bit easier. Uh, yeah, uh, what is that mechanism of weighing? Of course, who knows, right? I mean, we're, we're just kind of, uh, uh, but there, is there, is there a mechanism of weighing that's been selected for? Of course, not necessarily, it could also just be, Kind of an explanation more at the level of kind of biochemistry, mm -hmm. uh, but let's even say that that it has but been selected. It was for. super inefficient. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's been selected. 
but let's even say that that it, that it had been selected for. I mean, it, a, another metaphor could be like in computer science, in like a, a, a type of artificial intelligence, a kind of a complex neural net, which does seem to make some type of deliberation. Uh, and so I think what the response there is that, well, uh, selection may have designed that deliberative mechanism, but selection can't really explain whatever the deliberative mechanism in those particular circumstances uh, came up with. That you, that in a certain sense, the deliberative mechanism it screens off uh, natural selection, and if you move into like kind of human nature ethics, I think the the closest equivalent is is kind of the fact value distinction that uh, you have the the causes of whatever rational capacity we have for deliberation, and then you have the reasons for action, and of course I guess that leads to evolutionary psychology and why that's also so lastingly controversial because of course they abstract away from whatever reasons humans may have for for, for behaving um, and I mean, yeah evolutionary psychology de defines certain uh, general cognitive mechanisms um, but I guess the, the worst excesses of current evolutionary psychology are precisely those who kind of take that type of idealized model of human behavior and then <coughs> ignore uh, uh, everything that, uh, that or human behaviors that m might uh, depart from that model. Um, so what is the lesson from that? I mean, I think it's I think it's not evolutionary psychology, let's say, put it that way. This, uh, uh, I mean, I think evolutionary psychology, when it uh, attempts to uh, make authoritative statements of the causes of human behavior beyond certain very kind of broad patterns, uh, I think that they're ignoring deliberation rather than taking it into consideration. Oh, I agree. Yeah. But it's in the same spirit where it's the mechanism that is could be selected and not the the behavior. But Andrea, can I yeah, yeah, please. share someone else? So I was surprised about now now because you said you talk about the neural network as a as a metaphor. Yeah. And it seems really closer to what you think. And so I was quite confused about the phase transition metaphor and the Spontaneous symmetry breaking, because, mm -hmm. or maybe maybe it's to input output the 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 neural network because I thought the neural network would be a nice metaphor of select of deliberation to a complex mechanism that can change <coughs> and be some with a certain opacity like for the bacteria. Yeah, yeah, like like that. It's a kind of a black box that yeah. And it can change and evolve. Can I, can I jump in? Uh huh, yeah. Because I, I had the same, I had the exact same question. I was also a little confused in, in, in trying to characterize this process of deliberation as a, a case of symmetry breaking, especially phase transitions, because that would be spontaneous. As that reminded me of a uh, was a bird that's a donkey that has to choose between two equal heaps of hay and then ends up starving because there's just no way to make a choice. So it seems we need some kind of explicit symmetry breaking, but then what is explicit here, or what is doing the breaking in that? I'm not quite sure how to... Uh, well, let's say real, real systems will, will maybe never remain undecided in, in precisely that way, because well, there are fluctuations and there are some... I mean, it may seem symmetrical, but there might be some slight asymmetries. Uh, and that's kind of in the direction that I would understand this process, that if certain environmental inputs, uh, you know, uh, presence of this type of nutrition, presence of another type of nutrition, uh, presence of a competitor, of a predator, 
there are many different, you know, do you, do you, do you prioritize avoiding the predator? Uh, do you avoid, do you prioritize avoiding the competitor? Uh, do, you, do you go into a new niche uh, where there are fewer predators and fewer competitors? Or do you go for the, the kind of the juicy price? Um, there are different ways in which an organism can behave. So in, 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 in that way, it's, there are symmetries uh, of courses of action. And that, so this, this model of deliberation then is, is that uh, for whatever reason then, the particulars of the situation pushes an organism into one course of action or another. But let's say the, the, yeah, the, the basic structure is, is, is that. And, and I don't know immediately how to connect that with the neural networks. Uh, yeah. But uh, still a phase transition, it's not good. No, because in phase transition, or you have spontaneous phase transition, so there's yeah. no no ultimate cause. So equality of all the x aspects, and the case of ferromagnetism is often understood that way. Or there's a cause. There's something explicitly breaking the symmetry, but you don't know it. But still, it's there. So it depends what you want to but adopt. Do you want to adopt something that smells determinism? But does it does or, a true or, spontaneous? Like no, phase transition exists? Yeah. No, but the, the, is it purely spontaneous or not? It's a discussion in physics. Maybe, maybe auto fluctuation, of course. Maybe, maybe it's a, it, it, yeah. Is it a purely statistical or is it some kind of nonlinear sum of stuff and there's a, there's a direction, but we don't know? Yeah. And okay. I, I, would, I would believe that in the case of the bacteria, there's probably part of this stochastic, part that is unknown but determined in the in the weighting mm -hmm. function that is used. Yeah. So I don't know what is the best metaphor, but... Um, and so, and where would the metaphor with, the, let's say, then an explicit phase transition, where would that break down then? Uh, precisely. I, I, I think the breaking happens if the child wants, as is impossible, of course, she, either, either he wants a cookie because it's tasty, or he wants to keep his parents happy, and they see those as a tool to minimize his stuff there and he doesn't know what way to fall. That's perfectly symmetric, but then I think that it isn't symmetric. Once he starts deliberating, he, I don't know, his oh, parents right. are, are behind the corner watching him. And so it's not that it's not at all as if the, the two local min are the same. It's, it's pretty clear which way he should go. Yeah, yeah. Is there some uh, confusion here on how the symmetries are defined? Whether it's kind of from God's perspective or from the perspective of the organism, mm -hmm. yeah. because you when you're talking mean, about kind of the because you said it's something of equality of uh, no indifference to go mm -hmm. and after the deliberation wait the thing but there's a priori and ind uh, indifference to go in your in your approach mm -hmm. so yeah, it, it looks it looks like what Peter was saying. Yeah. Because you seem to have this indifference to go at the first, uh -huh. at the first level. So yes, yeah, indeed. Yeah. Because there's no intentionality in your model. Yeah. So there's okay. something like that, and after that, <laughs> you, do you spontaneously go in one of the valley, or, or is it oh a new data? Oh, maybe I should not go there. Right. Or I don't know. Yeah. Right. I can. I'll think about what, how to, how and I, to as situate I said, it. I, I would be surprised yeah. that such an important mechanism of decision for bacteria is not selective. But I would be surprised, even if we don't understand it. Yeah. Uh, oh, but that's I yeah, don't so know. This is where I wanted to jump in, right? Yeah. So, so because I don't, I don't. I don't take it that that's your point, right? I mean, the idea you don't you don't you don't want to say that you don't want to say that natural selection doesn't play a role at all, right? No, but the no, point no. the point is that you can still tell that story if you wanted to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, the point is that this is a because that's that's so so let me let me let me let me back up, right? So so this is this is what I this is what I because I've struggled with similar kinds of things before. Um, <clears throat> this took me to thinking about so what exactly is the role of the metaphor? Right, and I and I understand the kind of the kind of tension that you're sitting with, right? Because on the one hand, 
you feel like you need to have some kind of a metaphor because it's freaky to say that bacteria deliberate. Right. So you just don't want to, like, right, right? That's just, that's just weird. And so you want to have some way to cash that out in terms of something that, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. So like makes it seem less weird. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it feels like it's not, it's, frankly, it's not clear to me if the metaphor is doing anything more than that, than being like an incredulous stare reduction function, right? Because if the deliberation, if, if, if being able to tell the deliberative story is still really screening off the natural selection, yeah. then the deliberative explanation is a freestanding, legitimate explanation of what's going on here. And even if it feels yeah, freaky to you to say that the bacteria deliberate, suck it up, the bacteria deliberate, sorry. Like it's oh. weird, yeah. But and so that's I mean I, that, that's kind of my I'm sort of wondering. So 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 I think one thing that would help here is is clarifying the role of the metaphor. Yeah. Why why do we why do we need the metaphor other than other than to like to like make the pill make the medicine taste better as it goes down? Um, uh, yeah, because it, um, partially pragmatic because I think that sure. we can't. I think we. When we're thinking about agency, we, we don't we can't avoid metaphors. So let's 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 then think about what metaphors are better than others. And I think deliberation is a better metaphor than just intentionality, um, because whether we like it or not, something like intentionality seems to be motivating a lot of more technical uh, work uh, at play. But do you need that metaphor once the more, uh, let's say, once the story has been told in you know causal mechanistic terms, which and I try to do in, in terms of phase transitions, but I need to uh, maybe be more precise about explicit versus uh, spontaneous and, and so on. Um, I mean, I wouldn't say bacteria deliberate suck it up. Because I don't know, I've too many, too much experience of Wittgensteinians who just attack you and say you've fundamentally misunderstood the concept of <laughs> deliberation, and so it's. Uh, I mean, I, 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 that's not the hill I want to die on. Uh, it's just like it's. It's fine. It's as if deliberation, uh, yeah. and we can translate it into, you know, causal terms. It's, it's just not a simple optimization process. It's, it's something, uh, uh, something else, something symmetry breaking. But, uh, um, uh, but why talk about the metaphor at all? I don't know. It's just kind of how the human mind works, you know, philosophy. It's, it's, it's somehow clearer. I mean, the deliberation does identify a type of a structure Binding goals and action together, and perhaps you know sensory input, right? And that type that type of abstract structure, you can translate then into, and so it's, it's kind of a more intuitive way of, of just capturing that that abstract structure. Uh, so yeah, maybe maybe that's uh, a res proper if, response. If I can if I can keep going for a second, sorry. Um, so maybe that, I mean, so maybe this is, I'm, 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 I'm seriously speculating here, but, but maybe, maybe something like this would help. Um, so a danger that I think that someone might see here, and I think that this comes out in this discussion of, of the, the symmetry breaking, is if somebody reads that metaphor as like, so look, I'm trying to show you what, kind of causal structure is really isomorphic to what's going on in the case of, of these apparent as if deliberations, right? Then the, the, the symmetry story really has to carry a lot of weight, right? It's not just a helpful guide to sort of get your head in the right place for thinking about what's going on when <coughs> the bacteria does chemotaxis. It's like, no, the causal structure really needs to be like bang on the same. Maybe a way to go here would be to tell a story, so to, to have what's doing that causal structure work not be this kind of metaphor, but, but something more like, um, so here's a causal, here, here's a story I can tell you about two kinds of things that natural selection could produce. 
And I heard something a bit like this narrative in, in, your, in your talk, although it was, it was kind of at a secondary level, right? Natural selection could produce this sort of goal-directed optimization to a single endpoint. And that's the kind of stuff that we usually talk about when we talk about basic functional explanations, but also all kinds of other junk in natural selection. I mean, we have these kinds of conversations all the time. It also could produce, and this was where I think Alexander was going at the end, it also could produce this kind of second level structure for what it would be to optimize over a field of possibilities under uncertainty. And like, that's where the cool action is for stuff that feels like agency under natural selection. So how are we going to talk about that stuff? That could be what's carrying the real weight of like, that's the isomorphism. That's really what's happening. What's happening is we have this like weird two level complex selective explanation. It might make, it might make, it might help you to think about it in terms of something like symmetry breaking. That might let you get your head in the right space. But you could let something else carry the real, like, here's the isomorphism for understanding what the heck is actually going on with the causal structure here. Yeah. I, I, don't, mean, know if you want, I don't know if you like a move like that, but... Well, no, I think, I mean, uh, that's, that's kind of precisely what I have okay. in mind when I okay. talk about screening off that, uh, yeah. the deliberative, uh, the capacity for deliberation, let's say, uh, that, that you know, if you invoke that as an explanance, that, that screens off whatever selective story you might say why that capacity arose in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, I just don't think that if you refer to the capacity for goal-directed behavior, that doesn't really screen off natural selection. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's problematic because then why, why should we be talking about agency? We thought we were doing, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, no, I think I think that's I think what you said is a, a kind of a good good summary, um, and whatever I said about symmetry breaking and phase transition, uh, yeah, I need to double and triple check that um, because you know, I, I mean that's why I pushed back on uh, Peter and Alexander there because it does play. A, an important role. I mean, I want to be able to tell some type of story why this is not just a, kind of a spooky capacity that floats over whatever might be going on, uh, on on a more fundamental level. And I think that physics has the conceptual resources already there to make sense of something like a capacity for deliberation. Uh, but yeah, so we need to need to. Uh, investigate this uh, thing well, that's, that's spontaneous super cool. Thanks. Yeah, that's super cool. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. So, um, <clears throat> other things I want to say have been covered already, so I try to put it in a, in a slightly different way. So, it's mm -hmm. not the. Um, so first of all, great talk. I really, uh, I really loved it, and I and I think there's clearly something to it, like to identify this like causal. I mean, what I take home from from this is that like, you identify a very really nice causal structure that seems to be able to characterize human deliberation, but also some processes, maybe in physics, although that's starting to be, to be controversial, but more uh, like, uh, like <coughs> um, in microbiology, so uh, very cool. Um, so my question is about the, what, what, what occurs in the process of naturalization, and what makes it still like an agency, like deeply an agency model, because one, one thing that makes like uh, the human deliberation special, and I think you, you pointed at it, is like the distinction between causes and reasons. When we deliberate, we're looking for, for reasons for why to mm -hmm. make a decision. But uh, once you naturalize it, uh, it seems like the, the opposition between reasons and causes doesn't seem to be like relevant anymore because what, what matters is really like is really the structure. So it is we start from it's like a process. At the beginning we have a sort of indifferent possible outcomes. Whether this is the kind of symmetry that we have in, in physics or not is I guess something to clarify. But but there is some kind of indifference to possible outcomes. It's and then there's a kind of process could be sort of like a causal process could be computation. There's a process that leads in, in various steps to a decision. Then there's a clear outcome that is that is like that's the that's the way I, I get the structure works, um, and it seems that uh, when it, once the, the reason why you can naturalize it is that this process has to be implemented by some sort of causal mechanisms, 
which looks like you're, you're describing, I mean, a sort of way, mechan I mean, if you want to catch it out in a like, causal mechanics worldview, metaphysics, it seems like I expect this kind of abstract structure to occur in cases where we have a lot of like, mechanisms that have like, very limited uh, uh, inputs and outputs, or very specialized, but they can somehow work together. And then, in, in, in certain configurations, some key decision will be made after a process of like, deliberation-like process. And, um, but then we don't have reasons anymore. Causes all the way, so it's kind of um, so. Where's where's the agency there? Another way to put it, perhaps in a more polemical way, uh, assuming that um, the, the, the symmetry breaking principle is a very good instantiation, which is now a bit not clear, but suppose mm -hmm. that. So if this is agency, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, uh, if this is a, if this is a deviation model, and I. It's hard to see that there's agency there. Well, it's not clear to me whether that. I mean, if this is agency, then this is a, such a broad notion of agency that we are very far away from what we want. But I suppose this kind of literature wants to put into agency or pass on. So the way I take your question is that you're already now extrapolating this model to human agency. And it's like, uh, can we can we use this to understand human agency as well? Which is, of course, you know, just to, as a disclaimer, not strictly, you know, the, the scope of, of uh, this project, because you know, I mean, if animals don't have reasons, that's quite fine for you know every biologist, uh, maybe even better. So, uh, so th that's kind of it's it's not not a not a <coughs> if whatever, you know causal mechanistic translation I make uh, precludes or, or obviates any necessity to talk about reasons. It's not a problem when we're talking about organismic agency. Now what about human agency? Uh, um, maybe just do one thing in response is that because you talked about a, kind of a, a series of mechanisms leading to the decision mm -hmm. and that's mm, I think that's where I diverge then in thinking about it so I don't think that it's kind of a, a series of you know intermediary outputs and then inputs into the next because indeed if you could do that that would be be, be, be reducing it to some kind of complex uh, functional explanation uh, <coughs> There has to, I mean, for, for the model, what I talk about to work is there has to be some type of crystallization at the moment of decision. That there are a lot of factors that come in, but there's, there's, uh, there's kind of not, not any uh, intermediary uh, step that kind of already predetermines what the outcome is going to be. Uh, and you can ask, of course, then, is that, is that a realistic model of human decision-making? Um, I guess, <coughs> yes and no. Maybe some decision-making is like that. Surely not all. Obviously, we take a problem and, and we chop it up into smaller problems and, and, and solve them one by one. So, uh, but so just to go back to the, what I call about the paradigmatic examples of uh, like an ethical dilemma, uh, there are there's a genuine weighing going on. It's not as if you can, you know, uh, chop up the deliberative process into different units that you then kind of solve. Uh, it's a there's some type of a holistic judgment going on in this in these cases of deliberation, where that you kind of need to take into consideration all of the factors somehow. Uh, into the in, in, in the decision. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, so, just, so I, I I totally get the I uh, so uh, the reason why I felt like I had to try to uh, give a sort of like mechanistic translation of this precisely this holistic process <laughs> is, uh, is still we get back to the issue of like the spookiness. So so. 
there has to be like some sort of like it's a process. So either it's purely symmetrical, and then uh, like in a, in a strong sense. Yeah. And then what we get can, has to be some sort of spontaneous like symmetry breaking that comes out, out of nowhere, just like. Uh, but that's not what happened when, when we uh, like deliberate even in ethical dilemma, dilemmas. We try to to extract like a, a, a very subtle asymmetry that we thought was not relevant was 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 hidden. That's right. And so. And, and so there has to be like a sort of logic that takes us from the, and so there has to be a sort of computation and whether we whether want to, so the, then the question is how, so if, I, I strongly resist to take it as a black, as a black box because then it looks like the breaking comes from So there has to be something to say about this process and mm -hmm. perhaps because I'm, I'm, I'm bent towards like because only can see like worldview, although I'm not a Eugenist, I have to say it. <laughs> but I think that's still very good. Uh, I like those slides, by the way. Uh, yeah. No, I, I have a bend towards this kind of, this is something I really understand well. Huh. So I, so my, my tendency would be to try to get into the black box and find uh, something there. But that's why I'm, so that's why I am tempted to interpret your deliberative model as a, an abstract causal structure. Mm -hmm. That could be, Instantiated by uh, a complex of mechanisms, but it could be instantiated by some other stuff. I don't know. I mean, that's that's something to uh, for me to that is really that's a good way for me to uh, to understand it and make and make it work. So it gives it clearly a distinct style of explanation. So that's that's not. I don't mean to, uh, mm -hmm. to take it as a as a as a way to uh, dismiss it uh, and say no, it's something we can reduce something else. I think there's a clear like causal structure <coughs> that is uh, that has a sort of autonomy. And that can do a lot of explanatory work where the small mechanism doesn't kind of do explanatory work. So it's, so it's, so it's not a... <coughs> right. Um, so I think th this is kind of like really kind of zooming in on uh, yeah. what I described there as the, the process of deliberation. Exactly. Of course, like for purposes here, all that I needed was that contrast between intentional and then because I, I you know, if you abstract away, there is a real distinction going on here. But of course you're right, and if you start zooming in, and, and I guess I was only really interested in you know, before the deliberation starts and afterwards, and that you know, before the deliberation starts, there's kind of no predetermined outcome. But of course you're right, I mean, otherwise, I mean, if, if, if there'd be that indeterminacy during the deliberation process, it would be some type of a rational uh, process. It would, kind of seem, would, would seem to defeat the, the, the nature of it, um, and <coughs> that's why I suspect that when we're talking about symmetries, it's relevant to say that the symmetries are are, are the ones that appear so to the agent, given the knowledge of the situation. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, yeah, as the deliber deliberation process uh, proceeds. Yeah, it stands to reason that, of course, one course of action might clearly become more attractive. Uh, and that, I get, but we have that language as well, right? Where we tend in that direction. You know, we haven't decided yet, but you know, we're inclined to choose this rather than that. So I think, uh, I think that's, that would probably be my response to your question. That's kind of, that's, that, that's already more, that's, you're inquiring about the details there, and, and, and you're right, yeah. But it's just not, uh, I don't think I need to think take it into consideration for, the, for, the, for this uh, for a project. It just sprang to mind, because we're looking for this, this kind of mathematical way of modeling this. Uh, I think Mumford and, and, and the colleagues, they, they wrote this whole book on tendencies, and they try to represent it as vectors, where they said, you know, you can tend to something to different degrees, and of course, it's not as clear that you're going to go to that goal because there are many tendencies and they pull you in different directions. And in the end, you need to make some kind of Newtonian vectors so to see where you will end up. Seems that the deliberation could be something like that. There are possible ways you could go if you're attracted to them in, to different degrees, and in the end, you need to make some kind of vector summation, maybe to, to find the right course that you can kind of Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Sam sounds right. Uh, 
first approximation. Okay, I, I, I miss the part, but I, I worry now because <laughs> you're conceding too much. <laughs> oh, because uh, if, if they push you towards a mechanism that is causal, that is something like the sum of reasons or blah blah blah, it will be quasi deterministic. No, no, this crystallization, this weirdness that you want, and that will be selected. So that it's it it will be a selection, a selection, uh, a, 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 an ordinary selection. Explanation. So, so you need something. Well, Sorry, but, but you but you but said the right answer before. You said the mechanism has enough weirdness in it, whatever it will be, a spontaneous symmetry breaking, that it can the selection cannot explain this particular uh, chain of event that that the that the mechanism select. But maybe at a higher level, like the like the Shao, maybe their selection, blah blah blah. So so yeah, there's yeah. no chance because if you can see Peter, okay, well it's done. You know, it's done. It's it's right. selection, ordinary you're, selection. You're absolutely right. Of course, I uh, I guess you're I, a nice man. <laughs> <laughs> you should not concede to these two too much. No, I, I said a first approximation because of course, um, I mean, like, you could take that in two different directions. That, that picture of, uh, and you could, you could take it also in the direction of just like deliberation as a calculation. And, and that you kind of just need to plug in the different values and then you get the outcome that way. And of course that's, that's, that's not what I'm describing here because that's, then, then you don't really need, I mean then deliberation is not kind of screening off whatever designed that uh, that, that equation, let's say. Uh, so, but I, yeah, I said a first approximation because I, I need to look at whatever they actually said. Uh, if, uh, uh, um, and maybe in, in, I mean, I do think that whatever account of agency that one gives, you need to show how it's at least translatable into kind of, let's say, causal mechanistic terms. Without saying that, you know, that you, I guess, what, what is the standard way of saying that? That you can have the physicalist reduction, but not the explanatory reduction. Uh, I'm pretty happy with that standard way of phrasing it. And we have four minutes, I'm going to ask a very quick question. Four, Andrea. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, it's, no, no, but, you do. No, but <laughs> I, I really enjoyed the, the discussion, so uh, no regrets. Uh, no, I just wanted to, um, I really like the, 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 um, your description of the four models of agency. I mean, the, the, so, Okasha, Moreno, Mosio, Walsh, and Frimston, basically. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and then you say, uh, it's, it's very interesting for me because it's literally where I'm really going through in yeah, the last yeah, few yeah. years. Uh, I'm still going through a lot of stuff. But I, 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 there's a lot of stuff I don't understand. We're all uh, still going through it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, um, and, and then you say, well, the, the common theme between these four models is that um, intentionality is the, is the model of, of, of agency. Yeah. I mean, the, the way I understand it, the, the way I met uh, in the like working out of this material, is that I think Okasha, mm -hmm. I would say, uh, Okasha is a very inflationary concept of agency that models over um, human agency and then has to go to an end, like as if mode, because of course, you, you, as you were saying, that sits uneasy with, the, with, with biology. But I wonder whether that's the case for, um, uh, you, you actually mentioned, you, you, the second you call autopoiesis, the, sec the third you call ecological psychology. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about a little bit in the middle, so inact inactivism, which is a little bit in between. <coughs> and, uh, for example, I think about a lot, the, the, there's this paper by Ezekiel Di Paolo, and he published in uh, Phenomenology and Cognitive Sciences in 2005, that for me is kind of like a landmark paper, on, and it's called, the title is Autopoiesis Adaptivity Theology Agency, maybe you know that. And he's kind of like making the case that, well, you know, autopoiesis and goal directedness in the, in the original autopoietic formulation is not enough. You need, you need more scaffolding, conceptual scaffolding to make sense of agency. And, 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 and the concept he puts there in the middle is, is adaptivity. 
And adaptivity is the capacity of the, of, of the system to modulate um, in relation to the its condition of viability. So it, what, is, what does it mean? Yeah. It means that normativity comes in gradients. So there's the, even the, the bacterium, there's, there's not just good and bad, like what um, allows self-maintenance, what doesn't allow self-maintenance, but there's a gradient of normativity where there's, maybe this is a little bit better, this is a little bit worse, so it's, um, and so I think in yeah. the case of an action, there's a slightly more articulated concept of uh, agency that is not totally um, the same as, as, as intentionality. I don't know about active inference. I've been meaning to read the, the, the last book by Parr, Pizzullo and Friston called Active Inference, came out two months ago. Uh, oh. So I never really, I still haven't got, gotten to the point of reading right. that. But so I was, at least with regard to, to an action, to an, the active approach, I wonder whether intentionality really is the model or whether they're trying to do something else. Yeah, well, of course, I mean, those, those slides were, uh, I mean, somebody working in that field could have challenged me on yeah, any yeah. one yeah. of those kind of uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, jumps that I made uh, because I, I didn't give much justification. Uh, <coughs> but um, even take the, the gloss the activists give on agency, I mean, it's still, it's still about self-maintenance, so like the closure of constraints. It's, it's about kind of maintaining whatever conditions that are necessary for the maintenance of a certain organization, so to, to maintain those conditions. So it's, I mean, how, maybe just put it as a question, how precisely do they depart from that kind of gloss where you know, organismic behavior is directed towards self-maintenance. Of course, but that's the, that, that's the call, it's minimal agency. Then you have sensory motor agency, then you have the cognitive, the, like the cognitive agency, which is, a, it's, it's always, it's, it's a very scaffolded framework where every <coughs> level enables the following one, but it does not determine it. So you have, right. it's a very strongly anti-reductionist framework because you never really can right. take the level to the um, but um, yeah, but even like those other uh, levels of, of biological autonomy, they're still all directed towards self maintenance, uh, even if there's cognition involved and mm -hmm. sensory motor capacities. Uh, you know, bacteria uh, relocating towards a more favorable uh, micro environment. Mm -hmm. You could, of course, analyze that as a, as a, as a form of self maintenance. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I don't know, that's just also my impression. I don't find much discussion in that literature how precise, what exact explanatory work it's doing that selection isn't. That, I mean, there seems to be a lot of re describing of the phenomena mm -hmm. uh, in, 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 in their kind of cognitive apparatus, but there's not much talk about natural selection at mm -hmm. all, I think. Right? I mean, I don't know, Almost it's, not. it's a big literature, of course, so it's hard to generalize. Uh, but you'd think that they would need to show, you know, why we need to view organisms in this particular way and, and what, what that's doing that, you know, we can't achieve through kind of, you know, the, the, the selection of certain structures. No, it's a huge yeah. question. So you, you, okay. you, you, yeah. You're not supposed to solve the problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so thank you very much. All thank right. You yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you.